speaks to the flag, and I am to take some of to the requirement of the list of saying, One nation, one God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> item number three is an invitation for a citizen to schedule time on the commission agenda for an item not listed. Is there anyone here who would like to add something to our agenda? Next meeting. Seeing none, we'll move on to item four, which is approval of the agenda. Is there any changes to the agenda? Additions or deletions? I'll entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Motion been made and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed nay. Motion carries. Item five is a consent agenda. We have approval of the minutes and you have two documents there. Approval of travel and education requests, approval of personnel action notices, approval of the human services report. We have a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Motion made and seconded. Is there any comments on any of those items? Commissioner Pierce? No? Okay. No comments? We'll call the roll. Borsba? Aye. Pierce? Krogman? Aye. Jensen? Aye. Bartley? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Number six, routine business approval of claims. Move approval. Motion been made. And seconded? Second. Okay. Any comments? Hearing none, call the roll. Pierce? Aye. Krogman? Aye. Jensen? Aye. Forsma? Aye. Bartley? Aye. Motion carries. Item B is the department head reports. We will start here with uh, Brian. You get the hot seat first, which is kind of nice in the cold weather. Morning. Morning. Uh, one item that uh, we touched on last week on January 17th, uh, we had a pre-construction meeting for the bridges south on 77. And uh, I did get a schedule uh, there. It's subject to change also, but looks like the work is going to start on February 25th. So we'll be looking at closures towards the end of February on 77. Did they in the pre-construction meeting give any indication of the time they would close that intersection going over to uh, uh, the lake? Um, yeah, we have a haul route agreement in place uh, also with Moody County and that, and that will will be closed at that time. Okay, do you, what time would that be? Pretty quick, right in February or later Right on? at the end of February, yeah. Right at the end of February, they'll close the road. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. And for our listening public, we think we're going to close it at the end of February, and our contract is that things will be done in November. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, so we'll be closed maybe from March 1st till maybe the end of November? Well, the anticipated uh, date that the contractor has uh, in place here be finishing everything on September 30th, tentatively. Would that be nice? <laughs> that would be nice. But there again, weather conditions will be yeah. the rule around that. Yeah. Okay, anything else to report? Other than that, we've just been moving some snow and we'll be looking towards the uh, beginning of February to be getting our annual supplies and materials bids in front of you guys. Okay. Any questions for Brian? I, ju I just wanted to say, because I think this is your maybe second actual <coughs> meeting, that <clears throat> last year we had asked Dick to do written reports similar to what the sheriff's office does or or um, county development does and that that's really helpful if you'd consider that and I know your report was real short today but it won't always be because sometimes we leave this meeting and then we'll have people ask us and and the road numbers the bridge numbers and all that sort of thing it doesn't have to be anything long it doesn't have to be anything fancy but it would be hugely helpful and I will get that put together for you guys thank you, thank you. <clears throat> no further questions thank you Ryan. thanks Marty, you're up. Oh, you want Vicky to go first? You have nothing. <laughs> All right. 
So noted. Marty has nothing. Good morning. Good morning. Give you an update from our office. Um, the auditors are done. They left last week, so um, they'll be in, I would guess, sometime the end of February to give the report whenever they get that put together, but they are, are done, so that, that's good. Uh, tax notices went out last week, so I'm sure you all received your tax notice, but they did go out, so that is good. We have got those done. And you should have received in your packet the finance officer's report for December. And there's four, be it noted items, the auditor's account with the treasurer, the payroll and additives total, the highway expenditure report, and the register of deed statement of fees collected. And on for December, we're showing for general fund surplus um, cash, it's 25.24%. And um, that is what we had as of doing this last week. And we still have 2,018 claims we are paying, and we do have some revenue we have to put back to 2018. So when that is all done, I will do another one of these surplus cash analysis. It probably won't change much, but to give you a more exact figure on that. So... Um, that will be as soon as we get all that done, probably at the next meeting. And um, also, um, we are working on, Jennifer and I are going to plan on going to a, the annual report workshop in Mitchell on Thursday, weather permitting. We will be going out there, and that is kind of our next big project, is to be working on, on the annual report. So, any questions that anybody has? Commissioner? First? We talked a little bit about this last year, and when maybe it was when we were doing budget, I can't remember. Can the bond that we have that's outstanding right now, do you have an idea what that balance is that's owed on that? I, I can get that all together for you. Mm -hmm. It's the last, it was like 1.5 million, I believe, but I can get the exact figure to you. And the conversation that we had, and I'm thinking Stacy might be reaching out to our bond person anyway, and it'd be nice if this question got asked. Um, is there anything that prevents us in our bond documents from paying that off? If we have the resources to do that, I think our interest payment was about $32,000 that we've got budgeted for that. And we would have the funds if we chose to do that, to pay that bond off, save that $32,000 that bond lasts for how much longer? It is um, another at least 10 years. So we'd save a substantial amount of money, and I I just think we at least should consider that, but we need to ask the, is it Toby, is that his name, on the bonding person? I don't know if it's not Toby. Mm -hmm. that, that would probably right. Tom. Tom, Tom. Grimman. But it'd be nice at least to have a conversation about it and see if that's something we should look into because over a period of time we would sub save a substantial amount of money and what we're getting for income off of the money that we have sitting is a lot less than the $32,000 a year. <clears throat> yeah, we can check into that or Stacy can. Thank so. you. And also I'm going to put together after we have these final figures is how much each department, what their final percentage was of expenses for the year and also the revenue. So you can see how much went back into um, the fund balance and everything. So I will put together that so you have that for your records. Any further questions? Vicki, I'm just wondering if I can get a more detailed aging accounts receivable for all those county liens, just so that I can see how far back that $7 million is actually aging. Yeah, and it goes back for years and years. Okay. I'm just curious. But we can, we can get something that will give you more what the years are. Okay. But yeah, there's, it goes back to almost the beginning of time, you know, so. Super. Yeah. Okay. So but, Commissioner Borsma is liaison with the welfare office and we are I think it's fine to say going to do a subcommittee to look at liens we started okay. doing that yep a couple years ago and then we were waiting for the state collection office to see how that worked out 
and um, Commissioner Borisma, myself, and and Stacy, I think, mm -hmm. are going to sit on that that committee along with Mike. Okay. And and look at some of those issues. Okay, that sounds good. I will get that to you. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Anything else? Thank you. Thanks. Preston. Not miss the chair. Good morning. So we had a couple of things happen in the last few days. Um, so just in case you guys get any calls, we did have some door issues and some alarms that went off on the chamber mixer last Thursday. Several of you were there um, and know about this, but just in case, we haven't resolved all of it. Um, that will be happening today. So we did have a few issues where sirens were going off and um, police officers came and enjoyed the food during the chamber mixer just to check and make sure everything was okay. Um, but all of that is going to be resolved today when we reprogram everything. So just to make sure you guys are aware of that. League started last night. Um, we had a pretty decent turnout. So we do have a women's only league, a joint league, and then we're also doing some educational pieces in there. We had a um, personal defense class that started in conjunction with some Taekwondo um, pieces that are gonna be in there. And this is a trial run. There's only six people in this class, um, myself, and then Mike Eichelberg are teaching, um, mainly to see if this is something we can offer long-term or if it's something that is or is not needed in the community. We had, of course, the chamber mixer. Thank you to everybody who came. Um, we also had some people who played archery tag. They liked it so well, we actually booked a couple of events off that. Um, the rubber showed up, finally. So I got a call about 3 o'clock in the afternoon saying I had a driver at High V and he had 16,000 pounds of rubber and where did I want it? Um, so I had no indication that he was coming and the semi just pulled in and delivered 16,000 pounds of rubber on the side of the building next to the gun range. So that was interesting. Um, two more things real quick. We did establish a joint marketing promotional piece and kind of a membership discount with Beacon Hill, Brickings Pistol and Rifle Club, and the Big Sue Bowman last week. Um, so we will be designing a joint marketing piece brochure that will go into all of the different places that has everyone's information, kind of what they do, where everyone's located, um, and then just kind of showcasing all of the shooting sports locations throughout the, the community. And then if you are a member of one, you will get a discount to um, be a member of each of them. One last thing is we have been working with um, Convenient Payments, who is our credit card processor, to install a new point of sale system. Um, and so we have a little issue with our sales tax reporting, as I've mentioned before, and it looks like we have found a solution that's actually specific for gun ranges. Um, we would own the software. I've talked with Sean about requirements, um, and if everything moves in the right direction, we should be able to install that this week. Any questions? Any questions? Thank you very much, Kristen. Thanks. I think we'll move on here. Misty is not here today. I think we're going to move on to um, Sonia and a 4 H report. Good morning. I just wanted to come up and let you know how 4-H is progressing as we've moved into 2019. Although our 4-H year began in October 1st, um, the rollover into January did start. A couple new programs for us with 4-H. New 4-H year for shooting sports where we have approximately 190 spots being filled by little over 100 4-H members. So between the archery, the air guns, air, BB gun, air rifle, air pistol, and our 22 pistol and 22 rifle classes, we've got 190 kids making their way in and out of the doors on Saturday morning, Sunday afternoon, and Tuesday night. We also kicked off a new robotics program uh, the first Saturday of January. It's kind of a um, bi-monthly class that's being offered 
to both a beginner section and an intermediate section, and that's being run by a volunteer who is super enthusiastic and talks circles about STEM programming, so I let him do it because it is certainly not my strength. Um, I continue to do some programming with the Hutterite colonies, and you might also see somebody did pick it up. One of the 4-H clubs shared it on their Facebook page. I haven't seen it in the register yet, but each year 4-H identifies a statewide community service project. Last year, so 2017 to 2018, the community service project statewide was called Blanket Buddies, and it was an effort to provide the fleece uh, tie blankets for different organizations across the state within your communities, hospitals, uh, cancer centers, nursing homes, um, domestic abuse shelters, wherever there was a need within your community for those donations. And Brookings County 4-H made the most blankets for the year. They had 77 blankets that were contributed to the project through the efforts of clubs. And that's a, a strong emphasis on the third H, which is our hands for larger service. And super excited to see that they received, re got that recognition in the paper and um, probably flash across the STSU extension website as well. The new community service project for 2018-2019 is called Souls for Souls. And it's a, a shoe collection that the gently used shoes are then distributed in third world countries. But there's another component that helps to create jobs on a more local level. Um, not sure how that might impact South Dakota, but there are receptacles at both of our doors at the BCOAC currently to collect shoes. And we do have, we do have a start. And if you think that you might want to donate some shoes, make sure that you know they're gently worn and relatively clean and won't stink. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's what I have. Oh, and as uh, the new year has, as I said, rolled into the 2019 portion, we're right at 246 4-H members. So well on our way to, um, I I'd like to say, regular numbers for this time of the year, maybe even a little higher. So um, I've already started receiving questions regarding horse programming and all of our 4-H members that exhibit livestock for Achievement Days have to participate in what's called YQCA, the Youth, Youth Quality Care for Animals. So we'll be looking at getting some of those scheduled in the near future too. Um, this is a transition year where last year and prior it was only our swine exhibitors and now it's all of our um, all of our meat animals. So we'll have a, about 150 kids that we need to have trained in order to participate at both County Achievement Days and State Fair. Are there any questions of me? Any questions? I have a couple, go ahead. Okay, you go ahead. Commissioner Kogman or nope. Commissioner Pierce? Okay. You flip my, a coin. My, my <laughs> first one was the 190 kids in shooting sports are they part of the 246 total? Yes, they are. Okay. Well, so. that's 190 bot. It's 190 kids, but it's really 190 spots, but only about 120, 115 kids. So because they don't get to count. They're not doubled up, but yes, they do include are a, a registered 4-H member and are part of that 246. So if if a, a child is in shooting sports, they're also in 4-H. That is correct. And then my other question was, I was out um, on the 18th, or excuse me, the 17th, for the uh, mixer that was out at the BCOAC, and it was very nice, and I mean, the food was wonderful, and I thought there was a reasonably good turnout, and Game Fish and Parks was there, and uh, Kristen was there with her staff, but 4-H didn't participate. I had several people ask me 4-H questions. Oh, which shoot. I didn't know the answers to. Well, I'm sorry about that. I had some kid activities that evening with ball games and stuff and didn't even think about having something present for the evening. It's just so, something to think about. Yeah, the, for future. The synergy between those, when something's going on in the building, it would be great if 4-H participated in it. And I think we would maybe get some more interest in pro, what sure, we're doing for yep. programming. 
Commissioner Krogman? No, just thank you for the update. We appreciate no you coming in and giving us the numbers and the update, and it's always good to hear from you. I know that the MOU is uh, further down the agenda. I don't believe it's changed much from previous years. Do you have any questions for me about that? I don't. I did. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> in, in that memorandum of understanding, it says that SDSU extension will provide um, programming and I can't remember the exact phrase, what are you getting from SDSU Extension for programming? What are they giving us that's part of that understanding? Whatever I decide to do. Is there an excellent um, trickle-down effect right now? No. Okay. Um, Where I think I know I told you when I was here earlier that in the fall that there was going to be interviews that week or the following week for the program director on campus that interview did extend an offer and was turned down so that position is again open and I would say that right now from that perspective with that lack of position being um, occupied we are definitely I don't want to say we're lost lost ships at sea or anything but there is probably less direction currently. However, the resources that we have available um, within our offices, within um, shared spaces between other counties and such, um, it, it's still there. We don't have, uh, we're currently working on some, I think they're calling them work groups, to identify some gaps in programming to help improve what is made available from the top down. Great. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Any further questions? Do you want Sonia to stay around until we get to that MOU or are we okay? I think okay. we're fine. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia, for your report. Uh, and Mike is not here, I see. So what we're going to do at this point is I'm going to go to the Community Health Quarterly Report. Jen. Pardon. Good morning, my name is Jen Burns, like you said. Um, I'm one of the nurses at the Department of Health, Community Health, WIC office. Um, we're doing good, our numbers have been down the last couple months, as you can kind of see on our services provided. Um, there's always something to do in the office that we can scrounge up and keep ourselves busy. Um, we've kind of seen a little increase the last couple weeks, so that's promising. But we're still, again, trying to reach out um, to the community to kind of spread the word about what we do and what we offer as far as the WIC, um, the supplemental food program that we offer. Um, immunizations, we um, participated in the Brookings pod this last, and we did amazing. We were one of the best throughout the state. We actually ordered, I think it was 800 doses, and we ended up borrowing some from Watertown because they had a lot left over. So we gave a little over 900 doses to college students, the flu vaccine that day. And student health, we transferred the vaccine to student health, and they're actually continuing to provide the flu vaccine. So I think they've given an additional just under 200, I believe. So that's exciting news, and we're just kind of waiting to see what's going to happen next fall. We're due for a tabletop exercise, but more than likely, since we did so good, I'm thinking it's going to, we're going to do similar to what we did last year, but it's kind of still in the progress, the works, but trying to offer flu vaccines still in our office. We're also giving a fair amount of vaccines to um, transfer students, um, kindergartners that are needing, or the sixth grade and up that need that Tdap and meningococcal, um, HPV, we're also giving those in the office. And with immunizations, we still do um, immunizations for Medicaid, people who don't have insurance, and also that do have insurance, we're also able to provide them with vaccines too. So any, pretty much anybody 18 and under who walks in our office can get any immunization. And then adults, we just do the flu vaccine. School services, um, again, we finished most of those last September. We are um, scheduling our growth and development classes at Sioux Valley and Dubrick here in March, April. We'll get those completed and then we'll again, contract out to our schools for next year's school services. Um, 
prenatal education, like I said, we've had a couple of pre our pregnant moms are kind of starting to increase a little bit, which is exciting um, in our office. So we meet with them every month, do the prenatal education, um, smoking sensation, immunizations, assess safe, safe sleep. If they're needing that pack and play, we issue those continuously. We're fully staffed still. Yay! <laughs> um, training, we all four of us will be going to Pier in July for the all staff conference meeting. And I think that's the weekend after the 4th will be, so our office will be closed at Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So we'll be out of the office. So other than that, everything is status quo, just trying to keep busy and finding things to do. Any questions? Any questions for Jen? When, first? when people bring children in that are mm -hmm. under 18, do they have to pay for the shots? Um, it depends. If they have, they can, if they have Medicaid, we'll bill Medicaid. If they have private insurance, we bill the private insurance. If they do not have insurance, we offer, we discuss with them an administration fee of $20 per vaccine. And if they're not able to pay that, then we ask what they're offer, or able to offer. So no child is turned down any vaccines. Mm -mm, thank you. <laughs> nope. And then instead of coming quarterly, we'll also be coming twice a year. So that's kind of a changeover. A little okay, bit. Do you, uh, the, the adult flu vaccine, mm -hmm. where are you at on that as far as participation and costs for people to walk yep. in and get a flu Again, shot? Again, we bill private or it's $45, 45. per yeah. vaccine. Yep. Or for I think it's good for the shot. public to know that they can stop and see you for 45 yes. they can get a, yep. a flu 45. shot. Apparently that. It's not too late for that, apparently. It's never too late. No, we have vaccine in our office. It's good till June 30th. So, yeah, <laughs> so I already give have it my until shot. then. <laughs> I had my very first shot this year. Awesome. So. Good job. Thank but, you. Uh, I couldn't get out of the clinic without it, according to my doctor. So, any other questions? All right. Thank you very All much right. for yep, your thank report. Thank you. Have a good day. Okay. We're really close to 9 o'clock at 8.58. So, I think we're going to move Marty and ask you to introduce the, uh, the, uh, Nine o'clock report on the presentation on AT&T FirstNet. <laughs> Short introduction. Ladies, please come on up to the microphone here. And if you'd like, like to pull up an extra chair, you certainly can. You don't have to stand. I'll let Cindy pass out. I'm Pam Bryan from at and I'll let Cindy pass out some information on uh, FirstNet, and then we'll kind of go over what FirstNet is and where it comes from and where it's going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Would you like to start while she's passing those sure, out? Sure, sure. Please, thank you. I'm not sure if anyone here um, knows what FirstNet is. You've probably heard a little bit about it, but um, it was derived from the federal government, and it all come from the 9-11 um, incident in New York that uh, the federal government decided one of the worst problems of the 9-11 uh, deal <laughs> The 9-11 thing, that it, it was communications. There was lack of communications. That's why a lot of the people were killed in 9-11. Um, so the federal government decided they were going to uh, make, work on something to make communications so everybody can com communicate at the same time, no matter where you are or what the, what the episode or incident is. So they, they derived from, um, and they called this company FirstNet. 
well, they, they were going to build their own system. They were going to go out and build their own towers. They were going to go, going to go out and build their own company. They decided that's going to cost way too much money to, to get the whole United States covered. So they put, the, uh, they put it out for bids, and they <coughs> put it out, and, and uh, AT&T stepped up to the plate and made a bid. They got the bid. Um, it's a 25-year contract with the federal government, and what this does is um, it, it helps the communications of law enforcement, anybody with badges, law enforcement, fire, EMS, and then it, and it does trickle down to anybody that would help in a disaster situation. Um, we've talked to the sheriff and the fire chief here, I'm very interested in it because um, the biggest thing is you can communicate together. We have an interoperability system too, so they can talk to each other. Um, <clears throat> the biggest thing with FirstNet is um, we, we, we're bringing it to the table for the city because we feel that it's something that you might need or might want um, because you're going to have priority and preemption, which um, I'm not sure if you understand what that means. A lot of times if the best, the best way to say is uh, like hobo days here when the system gets all congested, when there's so many people on it, the data system gets bogged down. Um, if you're on FirstNet, you will have priority and preemption. Priority, you'll have, um, you'll have if, if it's all bogged down, you'll have the first priority of the system. Now, preemption is, it's kind of like a highway. If you're driving down the highway, they're going to be pushing people off the system so your law enforcement will have priority services. It's, it, all 911 calls, though, will go through. So that's not something that we're going to you know, push them people off. But, but we're going to push the looky-loos that are out taking pictures and video and send it back to mom. Those would be the ones that they're going to be pushing off so the law enforcement or anybody with badges will get, get priority services with. Um, they use the AT&T structure, the R, R, uh, uh, tower structure, and so, so that's, that's where FirstNet is coming in to play with. So, yeah, <laughs> so um, using our existing infrastructure, which is already there, um, if this is your cell site, the core, we take a core of that site and dedicate it to just FirstNet, and so that's where the priority and preemption is. So if, if there was a disaster in Brookings, a tornado comes through, we always have this dedicated site. Now if, say it wipes out all the cell sites here, we also have deployable units. And when you're on FirstNet, a deployable is something that you have access to all the time. It doesn't cost anything. There's a website and portal that you would go to that you just log in or we assist, which we would if there was a disaster. Um, and then we get a deployable hearing set up so there's no downtime in our emergency services and or council and commission people um, are able to communicate amongst everyone to get the, the disaster taken care of. So that's really, um, you know, from an overview, we could spend hours talking about FirstNet with you, but that's really what FirstNet offers. Is the priority and preemptions, the easiest way to think of that is that if you're on an expressway and it's rush hour, this is first net and you're always an open path of communication with everyone. You're not competing on the consumer side of the network during events like what 9-11 was. So that's where that really comes from. The deployable, um, what she was talking about, the deployables, it's a truck and it's cell on wheels. It's, uh, it's a sat colt, it's satellite cell on wheels. Uh, it's located right now in Sioux Falls. They'll move that truck around, but um, they have the truck ready to go, and they say within 14 hours it'll be, you'll have a cell site up and going. So it's not that you're going to be down. Um, where it's in Sioux Falls, it'd prob probably be a little faster. We have used the deployable once in South Dakota already, down on the uh, Marty, uh, down at Marty, they had a drowned, drowning. And the river down there has some issues, you know, that the... Uh, that there's no service. And so they brought the sat colt in, used it for the investigation and the and recovery of the body. And it was, you know, it worked great. It hit the whole bottom of the river and they were able to be able to communicate that way. So to bring that truck in, it doesn't cost anything. So if it's ever needed, perfect time would be during your hobo days or, or when you have a big event here. And I mean, you have concerts too, so that might be another option. So 
but they're they're deployable and they're they're here and set up and ready to go if you need them. That's part of being a first net. Pricing wise, you've seen some of the pricing sheet on that. Um, first net brings to the table uh, with the federal government involved. We have to hit goals. We have to hit things, and in order to do that, they had to bring the pricing down on on the first net pricing. So. For unlimited everything, for a smartphone, it's $39.99. And for the data devices like uh, the pucks in the cars or, or like modems in the cars, those are $36.80. So it's brought it down. Um, I take care of the state of South Dakota account, and that's kind of what they derive the pricing from. It's knocked that pricing down probably about $8 per user. So, so it's, they're pretty aggressive, pretty aggressive on the pricing. One of the things that you guys, we also have with FirstNet, even though they're using our existing infrastructure, is that um, when they partnered with FirstNet and AT&T, over the next five years, we have to have um, like 90... 99.4, I yeah, think, percent. Um, in building as well as outside building penetration. So you'll see, the, um, you'll see that coverage changing as well because we will have to meet those requirements or you have government fines that you have to pay. So for South Dakota, that means that by the end of 2019, we have an additional 42 sites going up in South Dakota. Um, and then that will continue to grow because we're now in year two. Um, we're pacing ahead of what that commitment is as far as cell site build out. So, you know, from an AT&T perspective, it's, you know, we have this build out going on it also benefits, you know, your consumer side, but it's the build out comes from the first net and what our partnership has with them. Um, we do have demo devices, which we have had, you know, the sheriff's office testing just out and about to um, test the service. And so, if if going forward any of other county entities need to try a demo device, that's something we also offer, so that you're aware of that. Questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah, I take care of the state of South Dakota. Um, total within the whole South Dakota, counting the state offices. We've probably deployed, I want to say, close to 2,200 devices already. Um, state of South Dakota alone, we probably deployed 1,500. So, and we've got a ways to go yet on that. It's just we're doing baby steps because we don't want to push it all into one. But, um, but the ones that have it, Highway Patrol, uh, DCI, our perfect test and example of how FirstNet worked is out in Sturgis this year. Um, every year I call out and I get this, ah, we don't have no coverage, everything's blocked, we can't get calls through, the data's not working. Every year, I've heard this for the last five, six years. I called this, well, they didn't call me this year, and I'm going, well, this, you know, no news is good news. So I, uh, I called them, and I said, so tell me what's going on, how's it working? They said, it's working, it's really working good. <laughs> so that was, that was a huge plus for FirstNet, because that, that's a good test of, of the coverage in South Dakota, because that's one of the, our biggest events. So. So it's a good example of what can happen and what makes it work, so. Question, when you talk about devices, kind of explain that, is it, is it my smartphone or your smartphone? Well, smartphones, you know, it's the good, the good news is with FirstNet, um, most devices that are out there right now, um, the newer devices anyway, um, all we have to do is swap out the SIM card with the FirstNet SIM card. So I mean, it's not like you have to change all your devices. And we do have some heavy-duty, rugged devices for law enforcement and fire, um, which they're running 90, 99 cents. So we're, we're giving good device pricing to us. We don't want you to come into FirstNet and have a financial burden before you even get started. So, And that would be on an agency paid. That's so agency paid, yeah. From a consumer standpoint, you still would, if you qualify for FirstNet, you would still qualify for the rate plan pricing but your equipment pricing would be different if you get like a stipend or you pay your own monthly service on it. 
you would still you can still qualify for first net um, as a consumer if you say you know the city says yes okay in a in an event we're going to have Mike be one of the emergency contacts so now you qualify for that pricing but if you are paying your own monthly bill your equipment pricing is going to be different than what an agency paid pricing is. Okay, so essentially, whoever is designated to receive this particular service is now on AT and T service, so a competing service. If mine's on a competing service, uh, I give that up. Either that or carry two phones. No, nope, you could still use that phone. So, if say you're on a competing service and it's you know whatever device it is. It, we just do a firmware upgrade on it. If you've paid for your device and don't want to purchase new equipment, we put a SIM card in it and you're good to go. Your bill will stay so. first net. Yeah. They're using our towers, AT&T towers, but it's it, the bill will come from first net. Okay, but your service doesn't necessarily have to change. Well, you, you can't stay on a competing service. Cannot yeah. stay. Right. Yeah, it's, okay. it has to be eight, or it has to be. So first you have to net. change. So if you have a family deal going on with a competing service, then you change everything. Well, yeah, she so can talk on that. From a family <laughs> perspective, um, if you qualify for FirstNet, then we also have a FirstNet um, uh, first responder rate plan that you would qualify for on AT&T services um, so that you're not moving over to FirstNet on your personal device and now your family plan changes and gets out of control because you've moved a device off and you're looking at so there's they've come out with offers so that it's um, an overall great package for your family as well if you choose to move them over that's you know this is probably getting down into the weeds but I can see in a situation where uh, people are different services and they don't want to change they're going to have to carry a separate device in, in most cases and unless they change to at and for their, well, you their can entire leave package your family on your you know well, yeah carrier. but you see what i'm saying is i don't Price want wise. i don't want sheriff's deputies carrying two phones oh right, right. fire department for carrying sure. two phones right i want to make sure that everybody understands that the, for this to more work the most effective they're going to change services correct okay that's that's the issue that i think most people are going to ask it's do I have to change? I like where I'm at. Yeah, well, you know, if you want to be participating in this or you may be required to, uh, you got to switch yeah. and, and deal with your family issue along with that. So uh, when you talk about devices, what types of devices? Usually always a smartphone, I assume. Well, there are some basic handsets as well. For instance, we do have some entities out there that still use flip phones. Um, that we so we do have some flip phones, but yes, we also have. Some. <laughs> Shouldn't be too many There's flip phones left out there, but there are some. I see them every day. Uh, <laughs> so when we have somebody who has a phone that they just bought for a thousand dollars and they want to switch and they paid for it, or they have a plan that uh, uh, allows for monthly payments, switching to this service, they're going to have to pay that off in order to to switch to AT and T and keep their phone, so to speak, as as, as their primary phone. Yeah, so that, then that goes back to if it's there's different um, offers. So like on a consumer side, yes, and there's all different like payoffs and different promos that run for that. On the consumer or on the business side, um, like from a government contract, you really aren't locked into contracts on that. And so then we work through those issues with the entity as well just to make sure that we, we help assist in like looking at what you have for payoffs on devices and what we can do so that you're not switching over and you have like a ten thousand dollar bill on equipment yeah that's always important not to have that yeah and, and everybody's different some people are iphones some people are androids it doesn't matter which phone they have whether it's an android based or iphone based Correct. okay yeah with agency paid it's a little different than consumer paid too um we, we have a 99 cent device and that's what it is 99 cents I mean, you don't have like the consumer side where you got to pay thirty dollars a month or whatever on the agency side. So on the government side, okay, and that's a completely separate device then. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. government, so yeah. Carrying two, <laughs> carrying two phones, and, and that's the thing I, I look after is most people don't want to carry two phones. So if they can combine this into to one device and it matches with their device and their desire, and their the rates are comparable, I guess, between services, but. Those are the, the nitty-gritty details that I think are going to be asked by those people right. who have to use those devices. 
uh, the fire chief, not only him, but all the volunteer firemen do I have to carry two devices and what, how's it going to work and how does it affect my family and how does it affect my other things. So right. as we move along in this process, if we move along the process, we'll probably have a lot more questions on that end of it that we'll need to have answered specifically. Yeah, we're kind of throwing out a quick version yeah, here. Yeah, and, and I appreciate that. Usually we have that. a slide presentation, yeah. but we don't want to take that much time. So. I appreciate that. And I probably have more <laughs> questions I should have already. We could so, go an hour if you wanted. <laughs> I know that. Any other questions from anybody? I just had a question. You mentioned uh, you had 42 additional sites. Are those towers that are go up, going up in South Dakota? Yes, just in South Dakota. North Dakota's got the same situation. Uh, South Dakota and North Dakota kind of worked together on this deal when um, the governors were back and forth. And uh, we had it going pretty good here in South Dakota. And North Dakota governor decided he wanted more towers. So then they said, okay, South Dakota can have them too. And it got up to 42 this go around, and I'm hearing it's going to be 25 on the next go around. So, so we're going to be covered in South Dakota, Western South Dakota. They're really hitting hard right now, and up in the um, by Cheyenne, Eagle Butte, you know, in that area, it's a really bad area. So, of course, they're trying to get those areas covered first. But um, on eastern side of South Dakota too, there's sites going up too. So it's just uh, what they're doing right now is doing pretty much drive tests, and when they do see areas, that's where they're saying this is where we need a tower. And we've told um, different agencies in different cities and towns that, you know, if you have an area that you're not having coverage, then we want to know. We want to know that area so we can, you know, have a drive test through that area. So. Okay. But. And by realms, Larry, that just means, like, in 2019, these sites go up, and as these sites are going up, they're, they're doing drive tests and overlays to see, like, okay, so we've got this, this area saturated, but we see that there's still a problem here. So it might not be a full site that goes up. It might be one that's like the sites that go on light poles or whatever. But then that's where the overlays come in to help cover whatever is missing in that site area. Any further questions, Commissioner Pierce? Just one last one. You had said it's thirty nine ninety nine for a cell phone, thirty six eighty for devices in cars. What devices in cars are we talking about? Um, like the police cars, a lot of times they'll have. Um, like the MiFi devices or the trunk mount modems, so they can have their computers in their vehicles and be able to do background checks and and uh, look at look up information while they're out on patrol. Does the ninety nine cents apply to anything other than cell phones? Um, yeah, the devices, those those uh, MiFi's that are in the cars, those are ninety nine cents also. Also, yeah, yeah. We don't, you know, the pricing on the phones and the devices that you know we can work with that. That's not a problem so we just the thing with first is they don't want to come in and say this is what it's going to cost you <laughs> you know because they don't want to they don't want to make it more expensive for you the federal government <laughs> says this is where we have to be so we're following guidelines and we got rules and they're watching so <laughs> go ahead Commissioner i had Plasma. a quick question for the fire chief or sheriff um do we have an estimate on how many total county first responders we have including our volunteer first responders? Purchase 15 phones. Those 99 cent phones, the agency have to keep ownership of those, or can they be owned by the the uh, law enforcement officer or other first responder? Uh, it, it would have to be agency paid for the 99 cent. If but if we paid for them, do we have to keep ownership? That's that was my. They're question. your devices after you get them. So if we say we're going to pay 99 cents, but you own them. That's fine with you guys. Yeah, they're your devices. Okay. Yeah, we don't we don't get them back. So, all right, Commissioner sure. Kogman. Currently, Marty, um, do your uh, deputies take personal calls on their cell phone? Yes, and they do. And so, would that change then if we provided 
if we purchased this and went with this and provided 15 phones that we said we gave to them, are, are we allowing personal phone calls to them on that then too? Or That would be, and I'm checking into policies. There are departments, and I believe fire chief has, the city has a policy that they can use their phones for personal use too. So it would be on policy, but they'd have to understand that it could be our IT could go into the phone and, and look at it also. So that would, not, it wouldn't be, uh, if it's going to be our phones, the county phones, there is that, I, IT would be able to monitor anything too. I'm not saying that that's something that we're going to do every, but uh, there would be limited stuff that they could do on their phones. Well, I just, you know, a lot but of people use. the phone calls, they still could get, but I, I'm, I'm researching policies right now to, to allow that. Well, a lot of people use them as, as cameras now, and if you're out ice fishing and you catch a 30-inch walleye, you're taking pictures with your <laughs> phone or, you know, that type of thing. So I didn't know if that's something that, you know, we allow or they would feel comfortable doing, I, you know, that type of thing, I guess. It's I, something that we'd have to explain, but, you know, we do a lot of stuff on Facebook already to, to alert the public. You know, like I have deputies out, and if the road, you know, I, at, at – Injury accidents and things like that, I don't want them to take pictures of cars and things like that because some loved one might see and go, oh, my gosh, that's my daughter's car. But, you know, road conditions, taking pictures of road conditions, there are certain things that I allow certain deputies access to put those types of things on now. And really right now we're, we're open because, you know, the, the county does give us a, um, you know, a stipend. So really they could be um, subpoenaed at any time, too, uh, for – Court, so it's, that's really not going to change, but we would have policies on what goes on Facebook and what doesn't go on Facebook. If that, if the county buys the phone, yeah, I, at the state level, you know, he's got a good point there. At the state level, um, like with corrections and uh, DCI, they don't allow the personal to, to use your personal device for work because of that situation of if there was a situation where the phone would have to be subpoenaed, everything on that phone would be in court. So they don't let the personal, or don't usually let the personal people, or people use their personal devices for that reason. Because if you had a picture on that device or comment on that device, it could go into court, right? <laughs> I would think, and, and we don't have to resolve this today, but no. I would think we'd want to look at doing something similar maybe to what we do with our iPads for the commission. You know, you get the, instead of getting the, the stipend, you get the phone and then it's yours and then county doesn't have anything more to do with it so but that's all stuff we can talk about later all right marty do you have any further questions for these no unless they want to explain the push to talk real quick um yeah we can if you want or i can um also the devices have a capability of push to talk and what push to talk is it's like a walkie talkie card on the phone and we have interoperable that we could set up that the uh, sheriff could talk to the fire the fire could talk to city police um, it's, in a, it's called an interop, interoperable system, and um, what they do, they take a two-way radio, to, and it's a box that they set up with this, and um, I mean, it's more complicated than that, but, it, but it, what it comes down to is you could talk through the radio system through the enhanced push-to-talk on FirstNet. So it's just one more way of communicating. Um, I know one of the things with the city and the county is they're all using different channels. This would put it all on one channel. Am I correct? <laughs> okay. Uh, so just, I know this is taking some time, but I want to allow uh, Fire Chief Daryl, if you've got questions, or uh, 911 Jolene, if you have some questions. If you do, I'd like you to maybe go to a microphone so people can hear it. Maybe uh, Brian and, and Kristen will give up their mics to the two of you. Jolene, if you've got any questions or you're, you're fine, okay. We'll just let uh, Daryl come up so we can hear him. Like I said, I've actually did a lot of study on this. I've been following it since the inception of the even the idea before it was first net everything they've talked about it really makes sense coverage i've been watching is <clears throat> truly become better and better um, i think that coverage rate is what we're looking for part of what they also haven't talked about through this process with the federal government they're going to be building apps and stuff specifically for the use of first responders. 
um, that will actually be part of this package down the road. It's not there today. But if you look at it, this thing has been purpose built for the first responder community. And I think it's well worth looking at moving first responders over to it. So, Thank you, Daryl. And Jolene, you have no questions? Okay, thank you. Any other further questions on the presentation? Seeing none, thank you, ladies, very much. Thank we you appreciate it. Appreciate time. the information. We will look at it and okay, thank have you discussions very much. at some point in time here. Back to our agenda here. We're going to move to the county development report. Bob? Mr. Chair, I just yes. have a question before he starts his report, if I could. You have the floor. Is your office looking at them using the um, this program, the first net program for yes. emergency management? Yes, ma'am. Did you have any comment about FirstNet at all? No, we're going to piggyback whatever the sheriff decides. My office is going to piggyback off the sheriff's office on, on equipment. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Sorry. Thank you. Bob, you got the floor. Okay, thank you. I had a staff report last month, last time, and this one just follows up on it. Some of the stuff that last time was proposed, and I did go assist the Boy Scout troop in learning about emergency management. It was quite well received, and it's it's interesting. I got there and I started talking about lightning, and these kids just popped up and automatically told me, schooled me about lightning and and things like that and what to look for because they learned it from their from their scout master, troop master, that he he had not not necessarily that that day during the training, but he, his past experiences with lightning and camping, he had, he had instilled in their mind the effects of lightning and how static electricity and all that can, can give you hints. So I think the Boy Scouts in, in Brookings are in well, uh, good hands from what I can tell. January 8th, I attended the city council meeting with Luke Mueller on the pre-disaster mitigation plan for the city of Brookings. We'll end up probably going to all the small towns and doing the same thing because the pre-disaster mitigation plan is a countywide plan. Each community has to sign up for it or, or buy off on the plan, but the county commissions the overall arching one that approves it for the county. And then the smaller towns are invited to, to join on board. So they all need resolutions too. Uh, the planning meeting did go well. It was uh, broadcast. Unfortunately, we was in the room over there, so I don't know if how it was archived and all that, but uh, it, was, it was interesting, and we'll, we'll keep getting better on that. The joint jurisdiction planning meeting was conducted, and uh, can I say slow as mud? Would that be appropriate? <laughs> Pretty it's, close. We'll, 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 we're moving forward. It's just not, I, I don't know how to phrase it. We're making progress, I guess would be the best way to, to say it. Our pandemic planning coordinating committee did meet. And um, like Ms. Burns said, we we're hopefully have a tabletop exercise this year, but we keep doing so good on those full scale exercises that they keep wanting us to do them because we give flu shots to either underprivileged people that need them or like college students, a, a special interest group. Brookings County Firefighter Association, we did meet. We had some, we really discussed communications issues heavy in, in that meeting. Uh, Monday and Tuesday last week, I went to Mitchell and, and took a Texas A&M extension class on threat assessment. And then on the 16th, I went to Pier. And one thing that came up in Pier was the 211, which Brookings County does participate in. And this commission pays towards 211. It was brought up that it's it's great for mental health issues, people to call in for mental health issues and find out what stuff is. But there's also it's also programmed to be used in case of an emergency. If we ever have a tornado and people want to donate, let, let's say clothing to someone, we don't want them calling 911 to see what they can donate clothing. We want them to have a, a point of contact, who can they call to donate or do this or do that. 
and two one one is what is in our plans to you. So, and I, I brought that up to Representative Reed out there in Pear. We had a nine E nine one one meeting, and what came out of that meeting was there's a need for a comprehensive study of our radio issues. Right now, I am currently working with Jeff Pierce out of State Radio. He's going to we're going to invite him out to attend an E nine one one special meeting. And they've got some radios maybe to bring out. And, and at that E911 meeting, we're going to bring the, the local fire chiefs in and tell us what the problem is. And hopefully, Mr. Pierce may not be able to fix the problems, but hopefully he can help guide us to figure out who to contact to help us fix the problems. That's, that's my main goal, working with Mr. Pierce. We do have a good radio system in Brookings. It's, it's on the digital side of the house. Majority of our fire departments use analog, so we'll just have to wait and see what, what comes out on that. But it's going to take some discussion, and I'll get with the E911 e people, and, and we'll get a meeting. Hopefully, by the end of this, well, end of January is going to be tight, but in February, we'll probably have a meeting of the E911 on that. Still working on the state and local agreement. They kicked back some of my forms. I got to have them redo, redone, and and I'll get hold of Commissioner Bartley to re-sign most of them that, that he's already signed. I did contact NRCS a week ago, and they were supposed to get hold of me Thursday or Friday, and they did not get hold of me yet, so I will have to try to contact them this week again on the Madari Township drainage issue. And realizing there is a federal shutdown on some of these offices, not everyone's working, so, but I... I'm not going to let this one fall through the crack this time. And radio we talked about. Planning Commission paperless records update. Last time I mentioned to you that we was going to discuss it during the planning and zoning meeting that night. And the, the zoning board seems to think it, it, it's doable. And the final quote we got from Sean Plowman was 2000 and forty six dollars and fifty six cents to go paperless. I today I can absorb that in my budget. By by the time it comes to December, chances are I'll be coming to you for a supplement on why I'm short two thousand and forty six dollars. But uh, I just wanted to get the the board's feeling on that before I. I don't want to just go out and spend two thousand dollars and then in December lose my job because I spent two thousand dollars. But. Uh, how much are you going to save in postage? It wouldn't be the full 2000 won't be the 2000 in the first year, but Mr. Plowman did think probably about two years we would probably save that much in postage, yeah. approximately two years. be about a break even after two years. We do. I mean, we obviously some of your board members have been on the, the zoning board, and we do mail out some, some rather large packets at times. And that includes the devices and the Dropbox subscription, correct? I'm not sure what the estimate covered. It would it would involve the is Mr. Plowman in the in the rear? Could he step out and <laughs> he heard you? He's hiding on me. The Wizard of Oz. Man, I'm back. I, I forgot my email that I had downstairs. So the question to Mr. Plowman, Commissioner Borsma. Um, so that two thousand dollars <coughs> roughly. Um, is that including the devices <laughs> and the Dropbox subscription or just the Dropbox? Uh, the $2,000 is for, um, I believe, 12 tablets, and I don't know if the cases were necessarily included in that. But I uh, figured, well, I assume that having a case to put it in will make it last longer and make it a lot easier to use, which you guys with your iPads, I'm sure you can attest to. Um, that is not including a Dropbox account. We're actually looking at um, Box.com uh, since they have a, um, if it ever becomes required, they have a security level that's accepted by the U.S. government. Um, it's FedRAM, FedRAMP certified. Um, so in the event it ever became mandated, we won't have to migrate. We just have to upgrade. Um, as of right now, it's not mandated for Local governments, it's mandated at the federal level, um, so we aren't we aren't beholden to that. But 
in the event we ever fell under that or decided to follow their guidelines for that, we'd just be able to upgrade. Um, the quote I got for 20 accounts with box is $4,500 a year. Um, this would replace um, our existing Dropbox account for all of you. You'd all have individual accounts. Um, and they do not allow account sharing. Um, ideally, I would like to purchase one account and then share it amongst all of the uh, planning and zoning board members since they're all going to be seeing the exact same thing. Um, I asked and I was informed it's against their terms of service. And in order to maintain our account and remain in good standing, we want to follow those. Any other questions for Sean? Just what's the downside of leaving it on Dropbox? Um, it's not FedRAMP compliant. It doesn't have right now. We're all we're using one shared account, which because it's free, they're probably not going to ding us. But if we ever decided to pay for it, we'd have to get separate accounts for each one of you. So what? If if the planning and zoning board goes on, would you call it box what? Yeah, box. Yeah, okay. You would propose that the whole county that uses Dropbox go to that program? Yes. And that would be the $4,500 a year? Yes. Each one of you would have individual accounts. Um, as you were <laughs> able to at, join and leave boards, we'd be able to share those individual folders with you. Um, for example, with Commissioner Bartley on the planning and zoning board, it's just a matter of saying, yes, he can access this, and then the folder will appear in his account. Um, I myself have to say that to make that would be a huge change to move us from Dropbox to another system. And I, I think I'd like to see a demonstration if we were going to make that decision that we were going to do that. Application-wise, it's virtually the same. Um, I tested it. I, I do not have an iDevice, so I haven't been able to test it on that. They did set me up with a trial account, and I was able to test it on both my computer and my, my phone. And it's more or less the exact same thing where you see a folder, you go into the folder, you find the file you want, and it will bring it up there. Or if you push an additional button, it'll bring it up in your normal Adobe Reader application. So when Raylan or Michelle put, for example, let's just talk about us, <laughs> okay, put, puts the packet into Dropbox. Now she does one step and everything goes in. I, that's my understanding. On this new system where everybody's separate, how does that work? Is it like an email address list? or? Nope, it'll be one folder that they have to drop it into and it'll appear on all of your devices. Individually, you can select if you want to be informed when at, things are added to those folders. So. For example, if Commissioner Piercy wanted an email when the agenda was placed into the box, you would get an email. Uh, in addition to, I, I don't know if um, Stacy or Michelle sends out a notice when the agenda is posted anyway, but uh, you'd be able to get an email separate from that. Um, it, and then if Commissioner Jensen decided he didn't want that additional notice, he wouldn't have to get it. So have you and Michelle taken a look at that to see how that would impact your office? It's the bit, I think to me, the biggest difference uh, is the individual accounts. Cause right now it's one shared account because it's free. So um, if you have an individual account, it would be easier to me. It's easier when someone leaves a board or comes on to a board someone leaves the board we just say we can we sean would have access they can disable that account right now um you have to bring the device in right so like former commissioner miller would have to bring that device in it's one password shared by everybody for that free account um so if we change something on on if we have to change the password then we have to make sure we notify everybody so then the next time they go in, they have to, you know, they have to know the new password. So this is, um, I think, logistically, 
it's a, it's, I think it'll be, it would be better in the long run to me to have the individual accounts. Um, yes, there's ex an expense to that, but, um, and we have seen a demonstration on box and it is very, very similar to, to Dropbox. And I believe they're using box on campus, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, SDSU campus uses box. I, our new employee is that will be joining us next week. Next week, a week from tomorrow, um, is very familiar with the system. Sure. You mentioned twelve tablets. Uh, each one of the zoning members would get a tablet. Then yes, it would be a county-owned tablet. Then so um, that way we don't need to worry about them keeping it after they're done. As soon as they're done on the board, if they resign, if they move on, since all of their joining and end dates tend to vary. Um, we just get it back. Um, they're very affordable tablets, the okay. $150 a piece for a 64 gigabyte 10 inch tablet. So if somebody has an existing tablet, they, they're gonna get another tablet, they're not gonna be um, able to? I did have questions about that at the planning and zoning meeting. If, um, since they are individual accounts, I am comfortable in giving them their own username and password because I'm going to be setting up individual usernames and passwords anyway. So if they do have an existing device, I, I don't have an issue with them utilizing so, that. So you might not need 12 tablets. Yes. Right. Yeah. 12 was the high end. Okay. Um, so if they would leave the zoning board per se, you could just disable them from where you're at. They wouldn't have to bring their personal tablet in to, yeah. to do so. Yeah. <laughs> And the reason we're getting a, at least one extra tablet for my 11-member board is in case one drops it, breaks it, we can automatically give them another one real fast and have one on, in reserve. Send them a bill. And just for some financial perspective, if we have a 100-page packet with the Planning and Zoning Board, each one of those printed off costs $5. So if we have to print off 10, that's $50. And if we have to do that 12 times a year, that's $600. Okay. Are we breaking even? No, not at that point. But if we have larger packets, we're getting much, much closer. If they print two-sided, then that's 10 cents a page rather than five cents a page. Um, it, it adds up very, very quickly when they're printing thousands of pages in a month. And, and I support planning and zoning going to a tablet. I don't. I, I want to say that. My question was moving away from Dropbox to a different type of application. I don't know that that's the right word. So if and I think what I'm hearing you say is that if we're going to do that, we should do that for the county as opposed to just for planning and zoning. It it would make the overall integration easier. Mm -hmm. um, that way, Commissioner Bartley doesn't need two accounts. Right. Um, and anyone who joins planning and zoning or in the event um, you wanted to create a folder specifically for um, some of your own boards that you're on, you could add that and access it without necessarily sharing it with the entire board. And I, I guess another question that I've got, and one of the things during the four years I've been on the commission is I've asked for minutes like when I was on Joint Powers that those minutes get posted, you know, that kind of thing, because I go back and look at them and then I don't have to keep them anywhere. And everybody, if a commissioner moves to a new board, they can go into Dropbox, they can read all the minutes without having to go in and try to figure them out somewhere in our county website. So if we have, I'm gonna use the budget for example, we have a new commissioner come on board in Dropbox right now, we've got our non-mandated budget and we got, I think some of our other budget stuff and, and anybody that's on the commission can go look at that. Will we have that kind of access? And when we have a new person, will that transition work out for them? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I think we as, there would be an administrator level access to everyone's account. So some of those things that would be shared, needed by everyone, um, we can make sure that those are in included in your account with your account set up. Um, right now, if, you, say you added something for one of the boards you're on, 
that would be able to be seen then by everyone else because we have a shared account. With individual accounts, you could put in every all of the information for your boards that you want. It would be just tagged to your individual account. And then if another commissioner next year gets appointed to that board, you could share that entire folder with them. Um, and same with planning and zoning, each with their individual accounts. If they want to put, each member can put different information in there it, with a shared account, then everyone would be able to see that. With individual accounts, they can keep their own information in there. If they ever do want to share it, they absolutely can, but it would be their individual account to have their information on it as they see. So I'm assuming you can group then also where you can just send stuff out just to the commissioners. Absolutely, yes. Rather than the zoning board getting the same right. stuff the commissioners are getting. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. And, that, and that's where I see the benefit of it there because if we're going to add them to the Dropbox under the same name, they, they may get everything that we're getting here, we which would, is a summary of your stuff and that kind of thing too. I mean, it's No, we would probably we would create a, a different user group, um, a different separate account from the commissioner's account with, if with the planning and with, zoning with Dropbox board. you can do that too we well if we were to stay with the free Dropbox account we need to create a completely separate account um, in order for Commissioner Bartley to see the information between the two we'd either have to share it in both places um, which would mean that everyone would see all of the planning and zoning stuff as well as their the normal Commission agenda information or um, I lost my train of thought um, I think I know what you're talking about yeah or he'd have to sign in and sign out every yeah, single time he wants to look he'd at have something. to switch accounts um, in order to pull up that information which is definitely doable but uh, I foresee it being aggravating on a good day is it possible for you to set up a demonstration at some particular point in time that we can all just take a look at it, do either stop in individually and, and have you explain it that many times rather than a big meeting? So if you've got, we've got questions, you can demonstrate it. You've got Certainly it loaded. I, I do have, um, I currently have the demo set up um, and I can answer any questions that any of you have. If I can't answer it, I know I've got a sales rep who's very anxious to hear from me. So, you want to wait till the new guy starts? I'm flexible. I it's looking at it. It's not going to be anything too complex. Where, if we were to start, if you were to say start it today, I'd feel comfortable setting it up today, um, getting the various folders set up and starting to migrate our existing information over to it. Would it be possible to get the permission to order the hardware and then uh, give you guys time to stop down and look at the drop? Yeah, because it could be the hardware could be used with either system, so I, I don't have a, a problem with that. But I don't know that we do. At what point do we worry about the budget line item? I mean, do we need a motion at this point to do this or not? We can't. Bob, well, it's not on the He was going to pay for it. It's not on the. I know. It, 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 it's coming out of your budget. It's but coming out of my supply budget. All right. We'll recognize you're going to be over budget, possibly. And Yeah, and I notified okay. you guys that it may go over, and if it does go over, the reason will be in the minutes is why we did this today. All right, so without so, objection? So that, yeah, it just so that I'm not a renegade department head spending all my money and then coming and begging at the end of the year, and you guys are blindsided on why I... Yeah, we accuse you of that a lot. Uh, <laughs> without <laughs> objection, go ahead. And okay, thank that. you, sir. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Plum. And then as far as uh, anybody else, uh, Sean would be available if you want a demonstration of box or drop box. Please see him in the next few days so we can do that uh, if we need to take any. Do we need to take any action on that as far as that's concerned? That's, again, no, we don't have any action internal. noted on the, on the agenda to take any action today on it anyway. But, no, I think it's just give us some direction and we'll, sure. we'll move forward. I think the direction at this point is everybody that wants to take a look at it should do that with Sean. So you have your answer, questions answered. Anything else? Thank you. Get Thank back you to Bob's much. report. Are you done, Bob? Oh, no, I'm not done. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, 
we are, we've got a new commissioner. I just added you to the severe weather email, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And I also have to make you an ID card, fancy ID card. I don't have mine on me right now, but uh, for our emergency operations center and, and things like that. And on in the same avenue, the highway superintendent, I discussed with him, he approached me, and we're going to get all the highway equipment to have tags, just, just like the humans have tags. All the highway equipment will have tags. And then if he loans out a, a road grader or a bucket loader somewhere, that tag will go with the bucket loader. It can be scanned in. You know, if they're using it in uh, Lake County, they can scan it in, and then that's documentation. If you ever do, like, have to reimburse from from another government organization, that being scanned in on the on the rapid tag scanners means we can get reimbursed. And there are also or avenues in there to put what we our rental rates, and but so the highway superintendent's working in my office, and, and Ray Lynn, we're going to input all that stuff into the computer and, and just make things easier for everybody. The American Red Cross contacted me yesterday. They are going to send paperwork to the BCOAC to get the shelter capability. There's some measurements and things we got to get, and and how many bathrooms and square footage and all that, and then we'll we'll get that rated as a Red Cross shelter, and once that's rated, then we'll, we'll go from there. The home show, of course, is March 9 to 10, 2019. I invited the BCOA. They can, they can bring flyers out on all their new and great stuff. I noticed that the SDACC, South Dakota Association of County Commissioners, are having a zoning session this time on March 13, it looks like. And does the county commission want me to go out there and tell you in English what they're talking about, or do you want to just go on your own? Any questions for Bob? Hang on. Thank you, Mr. Hill. You're welcome. We'll move on to item C, the finance officer's report, and the B noted items are the auditor's account with the treasurer, the payroll additives and totals, the highway expenditures report, the register of deeds statement of fees collected, and a finance officer report PDF. So noted. Number item number eight, we're gonna move into regular business. Item A is an action to approve the resolution number 19-03, a resolution setting weight limit enforcements of Brookings County Highways. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Motion made and seconded. Any comments? Only that we had this conversation before and the wording on our resolution, we talked about maybe changing that a little bit is um, paragraph number three, where it says on all asphalt surface roads during the spring thaw period and when limit signs are in place, the, the during the spring thaw period is a difficult element to prove when there's a weight violation in court, and that language maybe could be better than that. But I don't think we need to redo that, but we could look at it for another time. We okay. had that same conversation last year. Doesn't the uh, when limit signs are in place? Doesn't I think, that cover I it? I think it should just say in when limit signs are in place, but because sometimes we have weight limits even when that doesn't apply. When it's so not noted, we'll off. look at that change next year, then Brian. Yes, we'll, we'll look at that change we'll next year. Change now. Yep. And maybe okay. State's Attorney Nelson has a, a position on that based on weight limit stuff, but but it's ambiguous to say during the spring thaw period. <laughs> Any further remarks, can we, comments? Can we change that now, or do we have to go out? Can we amend this and and sign it, or do we have to come back and repost it and change it? Brian, what are your thoughts on amending it? Easy enough. You know, I, I have yet to send this to uh, Pier. We always send it to the Highway Patrol's central office up there to assist us in, in the uh, enforcement of this. Would you like to add an amendment? I would move that we amend the resolution to read on all, on that paragraph, on all asphalt surface roads when limit signs are in place. Is there a second? Second. Okay, a motion's been made and seconded to amend paragraph three, and I forgot the language, all asphalt, something or other. What, when, when do, do you normally have a time that you kind of put these out? I mean, you're not putting them out, obviously, right now, um, but.
but is there, what are you looking for when you're starting to place these or is it a certain date? Well, there is a, a, an available, uh, available uh, website that the state has that shows ground uh, thawing conditions, ground temperature conditions. Um, in the past, uh, working in, in the southern end of the state, that's what we based it off of. And then working with other counties also, so we're kind of consistent in that aspect. Because obviously these are going to affect producers and that kind of stuff. And so I guess I, I want to narrow the gap as much as possible, but I also want to protect the, the roads. I mean, that's our main goal for this. So I guess, you know, the closer we can get to where we know that that frost is coming out and damage could occur and we're done, the sooner the better, the narrow amount of time we can get that on there. I guess by leaving... Um, but putting it when you want to is fine. I just don't want to see us saying, okay, well, we've got some time. Let's put the weight limit signs out now type of thing. Uh, let's try to narrow it as much as possible would be my thought. And that was the aspect that I always looked at, too, to shorten that time frame. Um, I know up here is a little bit different than down there, but uh, we tried to narrow it up as, as much as we could. And then also the uh, notifications are all sent out to the newspaper and and uh, talk about there too. Cool. Any further comments on the amendment? All right, we'll have a roll call vote on the amendment. Krogman? Aye. Jensen? Aye. Forsma? Aye. Pierce? Aye. Bartley? Aye. Amendment carries. All right, we have a motion on the floor as amended. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll have a roll call vote on resolution 19 03, the highway weight limits as amended. Jensen? Aye. Forsma? Aye. Pierce? Aye. Krogman? Aye. Bartley? Aye. Motion carries. Item B is an action to approve resolution number 19-04, a resolution appointing an applicant agent for the hazard mitigation grant program. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. Motion been made and seconded. Do we have any comments? Any discussion? Hearing none, we'll call the roll. Forsma? Aye. Pierce? Aye. Krogman? Aye. Jensen? Aye. Bartley? Aye. Motion carries. Item C is an action to remove resolution number 18-51 from the table. This resolution was tabled on December 18th. Is there a motion to remove it from the table? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion been made and seconded. We will have a voice vote on removing it from the table. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. All right, that resolution is now removed from the table. Uh, discussion of possible action on this resolution of modifying the county highway system due to the review of the primary county highway system. It's my understanding we, we don't have this completed yet? Correct. Um, we're still gathering information primarily with the city of Brookings uh, to clarify the roads in and or around the city. Do you have a date that we can take action on this? Not currently. Uh, there's a few th items that need to be ironed out, um, primarily on a, a few roads on the southwest side of town. Uh, and when two entities are working together, it's hard to give the estimate. Would we look at sometime in one of our meetings in February? I would say towards the latter end would, would be safe. February 19th is our the date of our second February meeting. Otherwise, it would be uh, we're looking at March 12th, I believe. Is there a deadline we have yes, to have this approved by? by there our... is no deadline. Okay. Um, Can't we just, just making was... sure that we have all the proper resolutions in place from both entities when it is submitted to the to the DOT? Can't Brian just ask us to withdraw the resolution and he tell Stacy when he wants it back on the agenda? Can't we withdraw a resolution? Uh, well, it's hard to withdraw it at this particular point, but what we could do is table it till the March uh, meeting. That, what date was that? March 12th. Table it till March 12th, and if it isn't completed on the 12th, we'll move it one more time. This, this resolution also needs to, is done as a public hearing, so we have to have enough time to finish the resolution and then allow enough time to 
um, do the proper notices as well. So, I mean, I, Brian and I can I, just keep working together on it. Right. I believe there's some questions. I mean, it, the same with the city if their particular piece of road they'd have to do their public hearing also um, to make all that work. It's like you said, it's going to take some time. You want to go to the second meeting in March? Give you plenty of time. I think that would be fair. What date is that? March 26th. Okay, what we would need then would be a motion to table to the March 26th meeting. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion been made and second. Any discussion on that date? Hearing none, we'll call the roll. Uh, yeah, call the roll. All right. Pierce? Yes. That's Krogman? Aye. Jensen? Aye. Forsma? Aye. Bartley? Aye. Motion carries. Oh, you got your work cut out for you, Brian. Get that finished mm -hmm. up by then. Item D is an action to approve agreement number 19-02, a memorandum of understanding between SDSU Extension and Brookings County. Is there a motion to approve? Move. Second. Motion been made and seconded. Are there any comments? Discussion? I guess we discussed it a little bit earlier, so. No discussion. We'll uh, call the roll. Krogman? Aye. Jensen? Aye. Forsma? Aye. Pierce? Aye. Bartley? Aye. Motion carries. Item E is an action to approve agreement number 19-03, an application for occupancy of right-of-way of county highways made by Sioux Valley Energy. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Motion been made and seconded. Any comments? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Item F, action to authorize the finance office to issue distress warrants to the sheriff's office for collection in accordance with South Dakota codified law. 10-22-31, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Motion been made and seconded. Any comments? These are just the non-paid mobile homes and buildings on lease site from the 17 payable and 18. <coughs> so um, after they haven't been paid for that year, they are given to the sheriff's office to be collected. Any further questions or comments? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Item G is an action to approve the cell phone reimbursements for 2019. Is there a motion to approve? So move. Second. Motion been made and seconded. Is there any comments? I, I did hand out an updated version. There was one correction after the packet was posted, so I handed that out. That was in front of you this morning on your desk. My. My only comment is, again, I think we pay too much on these reimbursements. Some of us get more than what our plan costs. And that's not a good use of county resources. And this may all change if we go to the AT&T plan. So we'll, uh, we'll, well have to that. Well, that won't apply also. to anybody other than the first responders. Possibly. First responders are, are the only ones eligible okay. for FirstNet. All right. Any other comments? We'll call the roll. Jensen? Aye. Forsma? Aye. Pierce? No. Krogman? Aye. Bartley? Aye. Motion, motion carries. Motion carries. Item uh, H, action to approve and to publish the rates, salaries for county employees for fiscal year 2019. Is there a motion to approve? So, second. Motion been made and seconded. Any comments? There's a document in our PDF. You all got a chance to look at that. Hearing none, we'll call the roll. Forsma? Aye. Pierce? Aye. Krogman? Aye. Jensen? Aye. Bartley? Aye. Motion carries. Huh. Item I, an action to declare two water heaters as surplus property to be disposed of. Is there an action to motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion been made and seconded. Any comments? Apparently these are some water heaters that were already removed. <laughs> All right. I, I was thinking... Commissioner Jensen asked me if I was going to get any money out of those. So I thought we'd done those, but evidently not. I assume there's not a lot of value to a water heater. It doesn't no, work. So. Just some, uh, any other comments? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Item J, an action to appoint an Archery Range Committee member to the Brookings County Outdoor Adventure Center Advisory Board. The two names are Tom Cryer and Paul Weiss. Is there an act, a motion to approve one or the other? I'll make a motion to uh, uh, appoint uh, Paul Weiss to the 
Boise uh, Archery Range Committee uh, as the Archery Range Volunteer. Second. So, motion been made and second. Any comments? We do appreciate uh, two people applying. It's always nice to have an option uh, to have an interest. Any other uh, comments? Just uh, quickly, I uh, um, appreciate Tom's uh, willingness to, to go again. Um, Paul is recently uh, the chair of the, uh, the Archer Range Committee, and uh, in, in my opinion, it's just nice to have that chair on our board to be re relaying all the stuff that's going on there. And Tom held that position last time, um, so he did a fine job, but I just, in my opinion, I feel it's better to have that chair on our board than it is just to have a volunteer. So uh, Paul's also a chair of the Big Sioux Bowman, so it's good to have them uh, sitting at the table too as a user of our facility. So. Any further comments? Hearing none, all those in favor of the appointment of, of uh, Paul, please, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Congratulations, Paul. Item K is a discussion on the updated work plan for Brookings County. And we have a PDF in front of you. And I guess, do we go through this or are we just not necessarily? Not necessarily. If you want to, we can. The updates that I made from the last time we reviewed this are in blue. Um, the river bridges, we have construction information, uh, kind of a start date. February, as Brian had mentioned earlier. The Sinai Bridge should be hopefully bid later this year with construction next year. Some information on the township grants. Um, I do need to set up a meeting sometime with Commissioners Krogman and Jensen to discuss that so um, we can look at our calendars and come up with a day to meet and I can, we can go over some of the, that information, look at what we've done in the past. I believe it was maybe 2011 or 2012 when we, the last time we did this. I, I was thinking about an ice shack on Oakwood. Does that work for you? <laughs> Six o'clock. <laughs> no. Oh, okay. <laughs> Should we have the um, the work that we're doing thing. over by the plant that's on the east side of the county? I can't I can't think of the right name for it. Where we're going to do a bridge over there? Should that be on here? The Basin Electric yes, Bridge. Thank you. Yeah, Road Twenty Seven. Yes, thank you. Without objection, we'll add that. I don't know, I guess, if there's anything else that you folks see that need to be added or changed. Are we going through the items, or are we just looking at the whole thing? Just just, anything you want to add something to uh, or change? J just on the five-year plan, we did our public hearing and our plan approval on September 4th last year, and we ended up being pushed and didn't have much time for commission review on that. And I think we talked about doing it earlier this year, so that we had an opportunity to actually meet with the highway superintendent before the vote was necessary to look at a draft and ask questions. Yeah, and I had that, I don't know if the five year, or if the public hearing will be earlier, but the review process will start earlier. I have that on my calendar. I, I'm, my goal is to have the preliminary budget and the preliminary five year plan submitted at the same time. Cool. That'd be great. On number 11 here, uh, it says uh, what the county's participation would be with the small town. If there's any road projects or any economic, you know, issues that they're going through, is that, are there meetings, should we be attending those meetings or just to be there for, to gather information and maybe if there's questions or. I don't know, do you want to touch on that? I mean, when Ryan and I had initially talked, we didn't know um, what, I guess, what questions might come up in attending, right. in attending those meetings. And what, what concerns me a little bit, too, is, is when we start talking about those, then we involve our highway department, then we involve our emergency manager, and so do we, have, do we strike them to have to come to their meetings all the time now, mm -hmm. too? And that's what I didn't want to have happen was all of a sudden taking – our, you know, our, our staff and, and making them attend, you know, three or four meetings more a month on the different towns of potential questions coming up. So that's where, 
I was talking about maybe going there <laughs> one time and, and bringing the questions up. But again, I don't I don't know. It's one of those things that we want to be proactive, but um, I don't I, I want to be careful not to you know take our department heads and and and, and stack some more stuff on their plate. You know, if I, 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 what I would like to say is we're available if you have something, if you have a plan, and you have something going on that's going to expand in the county or roads or something, reach out to us. We can meet with you at a certain meeting, uh, but I, I don't, I'm hesitant to, to offer up our department heads for their services on a, on a meeting by meeting basis is all, my only thought on that. Well, my, my take on this would be if, if we were invited, one of us commissioners, and we felt valid that they could come into the commission meeting and if they could bring forward their plan to mm -hmm. develop or and then our that would our department heads would be here if they had any take on it but uh i mean there might be times that uh just for instance say aurora is going to expand to the south of aurora and you know we do have county road going south and just if they had questions about speed limit access whatever i mean that's are we talking about item number 11 now? Right. So, I thought that what we talked about before is, is not staff necessarily, but that we would reach out, maybe attend a small town, each of the small town one meeting, and just say, you know, the county's here, this is what we're doing. Um, are there things that you think we should be doing or that we could be doing that would help you? And when I listened to... Um, Bob, he'll give his presentation today. If he's going to go out and do the um, hazmat presentation to each one of the small towns, the thought occurred to me that might be a, a, a good time for a commissioner maybe to go to that meet, one of the small town meetings and just ask those questions that we just talked about. And economic development could be part of the question, but that might be our PR reach out, and it would tie into Bob having to go out and do that anyway. Just a thought. I guess all I'd like to see this administrated is uh, we send a notice to each of the, the, the city, county, and the school districts that we're available if they have a meeting and, and would like to have us attend. And then, then uh, when that information comes back to Stacy, then I'll I'll reach out and find out who can make that meeting. If, uh, obviously, good. not more than two of us can, but if uh, you know two people want to attend that meeting, that's fine. If only one can, great. And if nobody can, we'll let them know that and reschedule another time. So. I don't want to tie it to one of us. I think uh, it gives us more flexibility. If, if we right. find out what's what's needed, and I'll reach out, or Stacy will reach out and figure out who can who can make the meeting. No, I, and that's I. I just didn't know if, if we should initiate it. Was my my concern is if we initiate it, then they're going to say, "Well, can, what can you help us out with? You have funds for us. Do you have this? Can you help us? This is you know and stuff. So, uh, can you help us with zoning? Can you help us with all that type of stuff? And then now our our department is there. So if we send a, a letter out to them saying, hey, we're available if you're looking at s some projects that will enter into the county or affect the county, we're willing to sit on that committee or offer our expertise on, on that. And I think that's a better way to handle it than us just going to the meeting saying, hey, we're here, you know, if you need us, let us know. Probably better off just a letter and they can reach out to us. So I, I agree with that. I think we at least got to start by attending a meeting first and finding out what's what's out there. And then obviously some of those requests might not be handled by us or, or by our staff, but at least we have some information. And I think it looks good to, to go out and at least visit with those people. Okay, without objection, we'll move on here. I'd like to see us add a number 14 that says drainage and put Madeira Township underneath that. Without objection, we'll do that. Anything else? We're okay with the work plan then. All right, we'll move on to item nine, the commission department director's report. Vicki had already kind of discussed the general fund surplus analysis. I did put the two items in there with the current surplus uh, showing um, this one kind of showing the trends and again that 25 percent is preliminary after 
we get bills paid today and get all of the revenue for 2018 accounted for, Vicki will send out an updated one. But that's about, if you recall, when we were doing assignments at the at year end, that's right about where I thought we'd end up by doing the amount that you did and right kind of right in line where we want to be. So um, we did, this, uh, as part of the E911 board discussion, um, and kind of as follow-up to the dispatch center with the power outages that they experienced back in the uh, early parts of December, you know, the, um, we were going to pay to replace that entire system and found out that um, insurance is going to cover all but about thirty per, uh, $30,000 of that expense. It was a $164,000 expense, and there, there's about 30000 remaining, so... A third of that is county responsibility, so approximately $10,000. So that's a lot better than um, what we had originally thought we were going to uh, have to pay. So insurance came through on that. Youth and Government Day, just a, a day to put on each of your calendars. It's, it's Tuesday, February 12th. As part of that, the Optimist Club has their breakfast that morning, and it's out at the uh, Prairie Lanes Bowling Alley's Prairie Cafe. That breakfast is at 7 a.m., and I do need to RSVP. Uh, if you are planning to attend that, um, please let me know. I need to RSVP for that breakfast on Tuesday, February 12th. Does anyone know right now we if have, you plan to attend? Do we have commission that day? Uh, no, there is not a commission meeting that day. I'll let you know. I can go. I'll go. And I'll go. I'm available. Okay. Well, then I guess I better go. <laughs> Peer pressure. <laughs> we need to notice that then, if we're all attending. Yes. Yeah, and I, I it's just as long as I've already noted it. It's it's already been noticed as an upcoming date that you'll be attending that all at right. the dates below. So, um, so some of the upcoming dates again, um, the twelfth is that breakfast. Eighteenth offices will be closed for President's Day. Uh, Bob had mentioned. Um, the spring workshop is coming up March 13th and 14th out in Pier. This is kind of one of the two main workshops that our association puts on each year. And I handed out this morning sort of a, a, a tentative agenda for that meeting. It does look like it is starting at 8.30 on Wednesday, usually they start a little bit later where there's some, it's kind of easy to travel the morning of, and then it wraps up Thursday at about three. Um, I know you may have received this you know, already in your email from Chris Jacobson, just wondering if anyone knows now, I do have rooms reserved out in Pier at the Ramcota, <coughs> this is at the Ramcota and Pier. I do have res rooms reserved for both Tuesday night and Wednesday night. For, um, but if, does anyone know now? I know Commissioner Pierce has already let me know that she's planning to attend. Does anybody else know now that they are definitely going or can that go? I'll plan to be there, Stacy. Okay. When does it start, you said? Wednesday morning, <clears throat> Wednesday morning at 8.30. Okay. Is the legislature still in session then? I don't believe I don't so, so no. Is there a two-week break? Two week? Usually they try to schedule this after the session. Sure. And then the last thing I have is just that the legislative forums, I got this too after I wrapped up the packet last week, legislative forums, um, this Saturday, the 26th, is the first one for uh, District 7. It's actually here in the chambers from 9 to 10. Um, then Saturday, February 9th is the next one. That's with the representatives from Districts 4 and 7, both. And then Saturday, February 23rd, uh, it'll be just representatives from District 7 again. Those are all uh, from 9 until 10 here in the chambers. And that's all I have unless you have any additional questions for me. 
Got to remember that Saturday. I guess I'm the moderator. <laughs> Better be here. All right. Uh, any questions for Commission Director? Seeing none, we'll move on to item number 10, the State Attorney's Office Report. Dan? Okay. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Dan, would you want to tell the Commission about the resolution on the bond? And then um, I think we should ask Stacy if she'd reach out when she's talking to our bonding representative, whose name I can't think of again, um, if, if their request is going to impact our um, bonding ability on the jail. So, yes. So you. we sent that over to the person who typically looks Tom, over those yeah. bond issues. Tom Grimman with Doherty. Yeah. He, I sent, I forwarded both the resolution and um, <laughs> the resolution in question, and then the resolution from 2011 that was adopted um, on to him this morning. So before I comment, I would like to visit with him first. Okay. We just had a request to amend the bond that we authorized in 2011. And the question is whether or not it would impact our bonding authority in the future. And I think we'll be seeing a resolution, but wanted you guys to all know that that might show up on our next agenda. So. All right. No other questions for that? We'll move on to item 11, commissioner reports and discussion items. We'll start with Commissioner Johnson. On the 13th uh, at noon, I had a BCOAC advisory board meeting. Um, on the 15th, uh, we met with the commission to review uh, equalization applications. And on the 16th, uh, attended Brookings Day at the legislature. Um, kind of a shortened day, but uh, we drove out that morning and come home. Uh, a lot of good information. Uh, on the 17th, attended the E911 meeting at 8.30 that morning and uh, we discussed uh, a lot about the radio reception within the county um, different fire departments that are having some issues and uh, uh, Bob is looking into hopefully resolving this uh, situation at uh, 10 of the chamber event out at the BCOAC uh, it was uh, well attended uh, great food uh, I did participate in the archery tag I thought it was kind of fun and uh, probably end up doing it again. And that's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner Cookman. Yeah, um, on the 14th, we also attended the BCOAC advisory board meeting um, at noon. Um, it sounds like we're gonna start having our meetings at noon now as a consensus of the board. So um, we originally had done an evening uh, meeting. And so now we are uh, looking at having those board, those meetings on the, uh, at noon, uh, usually, Third, fourth Monday, right around there, last Monday of the of the month is where we're looking at having those uh, from noon to one. And I'm sorry, would you say what board that was again? BCOAC. Thank you. Yeah. Advisory board. Um, and then <clears throat> on the 15th, again, did executive session in the morning. Afternoon, I met with uh, Cindy from ICAP. Uh, she asked me to interview me for strategic planning. They're doing their yearly st strategic planning. And so uh, we had a good conversation there for about an hour. Um, and then on the uh, 16th, attended, uh, went to here for the Brookings SDSU Day at the Capitol. Again, well attended um, and uh, really well prepared and always uh, interesting getting a chance to talk to uh, state officials uh, and get a chance to talk to our local, um, uh, local uh, legislators also. Um, and then on the 17th, um, I had, we attended the chamber mixer at the BCOAC. Food was fantastic and again, a good showing, and I think everybody enjoyed themselves. Um, I think that's it. So, okay. Mr. Barsma, your report. Um, Wednesday the 16th was the ICAP board meeting, and that was here in Brookings. Um, they talked about their February strategic planning and then ways that the federal shutdown is impacting some of the funding streams that are coming through ICAP. Um, so it's putting some rural development funds on hold and some of those other things that make delivering their services a little bit complicated. So that'll be interesting to kind of watch over the next couple months. Um, and then I'm in the process of scheduling some tours of facilities at East Central and the domestic abuse shelter in preparation for board meetings at the end of the month. Thank you. Commissioner Pierce. On January 9th, I attended the joint jurisdiction meeting and as Mr. Hill said it was a, the meeting was a little slow, and 
what we're working on, and the reason for that is we're reviewing the first draft of the ordinance, and we're trying to avoid any unintended consequences as relates to how it, as we're changing things, and, and, it, and it is just complicated. Uh, on January 11th, I attended the chamber reception for David Marib, and yesterday was his last day. On January 17th, I also went to the mixer at BCOAC, and the building looked great, and it was just really an, a very impressive event, and Kristen did a great job with that. On January 18th, I attended something that wasn't a county-related thing, but I just wanted to mention this. Altruza, their literary luncheon, had um, Chad Sheehan come and do an active shooter presentation again, and we all saw you know, the work that he did here, and it was just excellent. He's always excellent, and I don't know if we should be doing any follow-up stuff if we think we've got that all under control or not, but he was just, again, very, very good with what he did. And then I did have a conversation with Tim Reed, and um, our security, the open meeting security bill comes up for public hearing, um, or a hearing in front of the State Affairs, the House State Affairs tomorrow morning at 745. And he encouraged us, if, if we know anybody that sits on that, to reach out and ask them to support that bill that would allow us to talk about security interest in executive session. <clears throat> um, there might be an, uh, uh, a problem with getting some support. So if you do know anybody that you can reach out and send an email to and say, we'd really like your help on that. And I've asked Stacy to give me contact information for Bob Wilcox, who is our lobbyist, and I'm going to give him a call if there's any way I can get a hold of him today. And then, um, Tomorrow is the first call for the public affairs legislative luncheon stuff, you know, where you can be in your office and call in and hear what's going on from Matt Krogman about those things that are impacting. Um, it's really the city and county of Brookings. And do you have that number? I don't. I need to get that. I reached out and then never heard back. So okay. I need to reach out again. Okay. And I'll send that out. And I'm not, unfortunately, going to be able to attend tomorrow. And I just hope some people do because I want to, I'd like them to keep doing it telephonic, but I have a BEDC meeting over lunch tomorrow. So, and that's all I have. Over lunch, so I won't be able to be out. Well, the number will go out and anybody at the house time can certainly attend the meeting. You're completed. My report. It's like every day here for something or other. The ninth was lead around table in the morning. Uh, good discussion on different things. Joint jurisdiction was immediately after that. And as Leanne had already reported, this is a, a work in progress. Uh, I understand it. When you mention something in one part of the, the joint jurisdiction ordinance, it'll reference something back in another part and then sometimes references it to another part. So when your unintended consequences are some of those other areas don't match up so it's a it's a slow process to make sure we cover all those things on the 10th i, I attended the ppcd and the pod which is a point of dispersion or dispensing one of the two uh in the pandemic uh, situation at the hospital that committee seems to be having a handle on everything that's going on which was good and bob gave a good report there on the 11th, I attended uh, David Murray's uh, farewell. Wish him well in Greer, South Carolina, as he's already, his last day was yesterday. On the 14th, the Volga Fire Department feed. I did not win anything over there except a hat, which is good because I'm balding. On the 15th, uh, uh, the executive session for uh, director equalization review uh, applicants. On the 16th, also attended the day at the Capitol, and Ryan's already talked about how great that is. On the 17th was the E91 meeting. Uh, my first meeting with them this year. A uh, couple of things were covered. One was the active shooter. Uh, Bob, and I don't remember exactly what we said there, but we talked about the active shooter and having training again, and there was uh, two different people or one person that we would invite in. Sergeant Kuhn from the Brookings Police Department has been trained on that. I think Marty's got somebody trained also. Okay. So that's probably going to happen, or at least from that committee's perspective. Uh, the second thing that actually happened there is we talked about the 130 or the 30,000 we will owe of, of that 10,000 from the county. 
Uh, there was also a discussion about having a second backup dispatch center, which we don't know the cost of at this point, or we're going to buy a smaller system or a complete system and where it should be. Uh, Marty had stated that it's difficult to put it in the sheriff's department. Uh, he has sent me a notice that he had some conversation with SDSU that was a possible location. We may look at some other locations. Uh, they said that they have room for a second dispatch center. The idea is to get it away from the center of town, at least out of ways if there's a disaster down here and uh, things don't work. We've got a dispatch center that's a little farther out. The university would be a, uh, an ideal location if we can work out those arrangements. Marty, anything else to add to that, I guess? No, that's that sums it up. That they they're open to the discussion. To, yeah, yeah. This is a discussion phase. We got to get the other system up and running first. But there was a temporary system that was loaned to us. Or I don't know if we're paying rent on that system. And the discussion was whether we buy that system from them if it's available and at what cost, or do we initiate a, a, a new backup system so we have one for nine one because we have had some issues and they're having issues all over the country. When I was out in Washington uh, State and Seattle. They had a huge 911 uh, crash out there, and, and their 911 system is going to cost them millions of dollars to upgrade. So we're fortunate in that regard that uh, our population center is a little bit less. They have like 15 people in their 911 center running screens. So uh, that was a big deal out there. Okay. Um, attended the BOAC mixer. Comments were made. I ate too much. Uh, that completes my report. I'd like to go back. Just a minute to this uh, uh, committee you had mentioned, the Welfare Committee. Do you want to establish that today or just we'll discuss it and do it at some point in time? I, I don't think we have to take any formal action. Okay. All right. I, you know, we just talk about it and. Well, we, we have two that are interested, and then we either add Stacy to it or not, depending on whether you think it's necessary. Because elected officials come and go, yeah. and this is something that will be forever for the county, I think it would be a good idea to have Stacy there if yeah. she has the time to do that. Well, I think without objection, the three of you would be the, the committee along with, with Mike as the department head. So. Mm -hmm. okay. I did have a question about the E911. Is it the UPD that's talking, that it would be the backup would be at the UPD or somewhere else at SDSU? It would be at their department, Marty, is they have room at, at the UPD department for a backup system, or they're mm -hmm. interested in having it as a backup. They have their own dispatch already. Maybe you could explain their dispatch different than ours. You're talking about SDSU? Yeah. yeah. The discussion is that they have, uh, they have their own communication center. Uh, they have, instead of 911, they have 511 that goes in if a college student in the dorm as an emergency, they dial 511 that goes into their dispatch. And of course, if they need additional help from either my office or they have mm. to reach out to us and so forth. But uh, the, the chief up there is open for that up there because they do have room for two dispatchers there when they made that building up there. So there's, there is room for that. So it would, would be the backup would be at UPD, not somewhere else. That's the right, issue. right. Okay. Yeah. And they're open for that discussion, but I mm. only. One on the level of, I, I wanted to make sure the police chief up there was one mm -hmm. discussion before they go to, before he goes to his boss, which would be Mike Adelin. You know, so. Thank you. I got an update from this. Yeah, we have an update. Go ahead. Um, Misty in the weed department uh, had a note here to wanted the commission to know that, that the board, the weed board, made a motion to continue the spray program and the gopher program. And also let the commission know that the Towns and Township meeting will be at the BCOAC on March 7th, 2019, starting at 10 a.m. Okay, so Chief. noted. Any other discussion items from the commissioners? Hearing none, we're going to move into executive session in accordance with South Dakota Codified Law 1-25-21, parentheses 1, for personnel discussion. Is there a motion to move into executive session? So moved. Second. Motion been made and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 We will move into executive session in five minutes. <laughs> 